Hi, Paul. You are well, I hope. Doing all right. You? Yeah. Hi, Amber. Hi. This is a special meeting of the Lake County Board of County Commissioners. We have a small agenda today. Um, first on our agenda is the execution of the due diligence testing contract with Anderson Hollis. Um, we have an emergency elevator expenditure um, for repair and then a board of health update with an agenda to follow from our public health director, Colleen Nelson. Um, so with that, we will go ahead and get started. First on our agenda today is the execution of the due diligence testing contract with Anderson Hollis. We have Katie Welter and Chris Floyd here from Rocky Mountain General Council that can walk us through um, what this contract is for and also Wells Squire from um, Anderson Hollis Architecture. So uh, with that, Chris and Katie, will you um, I'm sorry, Nan Anderson also just joined us. So with that, if you will walk us through this and um, our next steps. Um, thanks, Katie, are you able to, uh, do you have audio yes. now? I know she texts me. Okay, there you go, good. She's having some issues there. Um, I just wanna confirm that I believe you should have two contracts. Um, one is for uh, due diligence, site due diligence. The other is for um, a site needs reassessment, um, backfill plan for the existing courthouse, and um, and uh, preliminary schematics for the Justice Center. Do you have both those contracts, Commissioner Marcello, or just the due diligence one? Uh, let me grab my envelope real quick here. Yeah, both, both contracts were in the envelope um, I delivered to you, Commissioner Marcella, so I hope they're both there. Okay, I do. I have them both. Great. So, um, why don't we go ahead and cover the... Um, due diligence contract to begin with. That contract is to perform what we would call preliminary due diligence um, on two sites that are our remaining candidates for justice, the Justice Center project. Um, the due diligence, which I will, I will allow Anderson Halls to go into greater detail if they, if they wish, um, but the, the preliminary due diligence amounts to cost estimating for um, infra necessary infrastructure to both sites. Um, both sites are um, within city limits, but will still require a significant inv infrastructure investment, and the commissioners wish to be able to compare those sites in terms of um, water, sewer, um, electrical that the capacity of Justice Center would need, um, as well as, of course, gas and internet service. Um, so that's a major part of that contract, as well as evaluating the sites for ingress and egress and um, potential siting um, of the Justice Center itself. Um, Wells or Nan, do you have anything to add to that? I uh, uh, Go ahead, Nan, I'll defer to you, thank you. Yeah, that, that covers it, Katie, thanks. Okay, 
Great. And the um, proposed cost, the estimated cost for that contract is $59,253. Um, and I would just note that all of the cost of that particular grant would be paid for without county match through the underfunded courthouse facility commission grant, um, which was earmarked specifically for due diligence in contemplation of a site for the justice center. Okay. Is there a question um, on that? I do not. And that, that uh, due diligence testing you were talking about is covered at 100% from the underfunded courthouse grant. Yes. And, I, you know, I just want to be clear that this does not include any um, particular testing. Um, it's, it's really about cost estimating for infrastructure build out, um, traffic and ingress egress analysis. Um, I would just note that those are costs um, that would have to be incurred as part of the project construction, regardless um, of whether we did it now or later. And we're, we're doing with proposing to do it with two sites so that the commissioners can make an informed decision um, based on those, those factors um, that we would learn from the due diligence. Okay. But yes, entirely covered by the underfunded courthouse facility commission grant that the county was awarded last December. And Katie, we're, we're still waiting for the approval for, from the rail yard site to actually access the site, I believe. Um, actually, we have received that. We received that oh. just a couple of hours ago. Okay, um, great. So. Good news. Good news. Thank you, Katie. I don't have any further questions. This is Sarah Munch. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, Commissioner Glenn, do you have any questions? Uh, does this mean that we don't have to go through the eminent domain process? Um, no, this is this is independent of that process, Commissioner Glenn. Um, so the the eminent domain process. Um, is, is intended to allow the county access, physical access onto the Harrison work site, the Harrison Mon and Monroe site owned by Union Pacific Railroad for the specific purpose of conducting environmental testing, um, geotechnical testing and land surveying. Um, so the work that Anderson Hollis is proposing to do under this contract would not require them to actually go on the Union Pacific owned site. Um, so I guess they're, they're, they're two independent um, matters to consider, but maybe what you're asking is if you approve this work, um, does it have any effect on the eminent domain process or any work that might happen as a result of that? And the answer is no, they're, they're separate from each other. Thank you. Okay. Um, Thanks, Commissioner Glenn, for, for clarifying that. That was an important point. Um, with that, um, Katie, can you uh, just clarify for us how we got to the point of this of having this contract? It is a contract based off of the bid document that we had opened in March, correct? Yes, this, this um, contract, the, the request for proposals to fulfill these services were, were um, released through an RFP process, a competitive bidding process, which Anderson Hollis won. And they were the only bidder on the project, correct? Um, yeah, I believe that's true. And, and I would just also add that um, following an RFP process was a competitive bidding process was a requirement of the grant, um, the underfunded courthouse facility grant. Thank you. We did have um, multiple inquiries about, about the RFP, but in the end, we just had the one bid. Wonderful. Um, and we do have a history with Anderson Hollis Architects. They have done work on this project before. They are very familiar with uh, Leadville and Lake County and the project and very invested in the project, I would say, as well, and the success of the project. So with that, um, I will entertain a motion to approve the contract for the due diligence on the proposed sites with Anderson Hollis Architecture. So moved. 
second. We have a motion on the floor. Um, is there any further conversation amongst the board or discussion among the board at this point? Commissioner Glenn? Yeah, I'm still confused about the process as far as Anderson Hall is gaining access to the property. Um, that will have to be done under the eminent domain portion. Is that not true? Um, can I, can I go ahead. Ahead. Sure. Sorry. So, uh, Commissioner Glenn, this is Nan Anderson. We've got two properties. One that we were waiting for access to, which isn't absolutely necessary for this contract, and that was access to the rail yards property. Because we can really do this civil work, this initial uh, figuring out where the gas line needs to come from, what the water situation is there, uh, what the power access to the site needs to be. So we can figure all that out without access, actually stepping foot on the rail yards property for the rail yards. Same is true for the Union Pacific property. But uh, so under this contract, we don't need to set foot on either property. When you do need to have access to both properties is in the next phase of the due diligence, which as Katie pointed out, would include that survey work, the actual ground um, digging work to figure out what the environmental issues are associated with both sites. And finally, to um, figure out geotechnically what kind of soil bearing capacity there is on either site for an, an eventual building. So the current, the current contract, no, we don't really need to step foot on either property, but the, the next step in the due diligence process, you would. And that's where the eminent domain comes in. Okay, thank you. And Commissioner uh -huh. Glenn, just to be clear, the county has not obligated itself to do that work yet. So that we, there have been no contracts signed with, for environmental testing, that geotechnical drilling or land surveying. Um, that would all depend on how the eminent domain process is carried out. Wonderful. Thanks for clarifying that, Nan and Katie. Commissioner Glenn or Commissioner Mudge, do you have any further uh, discussion or questions on this contract that will be funded through the underfunded fund? No, thank you, Commissioner Marcel. No. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I'll, with that, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those, oh, okay, all those opposed? All right, oh. seeing none, all those were in favor of that contract with Anderson Hollis. We have a second contract here with Anderson Hollis. Katie, will you walk us through this, please? Sure, so this contract is to, um, it, it, it covers three different functions or three different major tasks. Um, one is to conduct an, a, need, a needs reassessment um, for both the jail and the courthouse spaces. So um, back in 2015, 16, um, some preliminary efforts were made on this front, but this would be a, a deeper dive to find out based on current data and current information and current programming needs um, how large and how many rooms and how many jail beds and the nuts and bolts of space um, for the jail and the courthouse, uh, the Justice Center. So there's, that's, that's part one, the space needs assessment. Part two is to complete, um, do it, what's called initial schematic design, um, which is sort of the first step in the design of the facilities themselves. Um, I'll, let, I'll let the architects tell you more about what uh, schematic design involves, but that's component two of this contract. And then part three is um, doing what's called a backfill plan for the existing courthouse. So we heard, we've heard over 2016 and since then that one of the big concerns and questions that the community has is what's going to happen to the existing courthouse. Um, part of this proposal is to evaluate um, the county's space needs um, also, the county's existing outstanding leases and other places to accommodate its staff and programming and how we might be able to repatriate folks back into the courthouse and make the best and highest use of that space for public purpose. Um, 
I, I'll, I'll kick it back to Wells and Nan to um, share more fill in the blanks, especially on the schematic design component of that. I'll, I'll start us off uh, and then Nan can uh, fill in any blanks I might have missed. But Katie, uh, this is Wells Squire, Anderson House Architects. And Katie did a wonderful job of summarizing the overall scope. Um, having worked with the county uh, back in 2015, leading up to uh, the election and working to prepare a, uh, you know, sort of an understanding programmatically of what the Justice Center would require. We're looking to pick up where we left off with information that has evolved and changed over time. So Katie nailed it, really starting off in phase one of three to look at a space needs assessment that was prepared uh, back in 2015 to see how that's evolved based on updated data and more information that, that has become available since then to uh, sort of confirm that the assumptions made then were correct and if they're not, correct them now. Uh, and there's a lot of additional input from stakeholders that we'll be looking to solicit to support that, that study. Uh, the second phase is the initial SD, as you mentioned, Katie, and that's where we take this information um, and hopefully this will work out in, in uh, with the scheduling of the due diligence with regard to the, to the two prospective sites, but we would then work to develop, you know, an actual layout for this updated program in the form of preliminary floor plans and massing studies and even elevations and visualization of what this building would look like. And that, that is to kind of an initial schematic design level. That's, that's the first of three main design phases, but it really gives us a good opportunity to investigate what the building would look like and how it would actually lay out and conform to the site upon which it would be situated. And then lastly, uh, yes, we would do an analysis of the existing courthouse to identify opportunities for new program uses where that building could, you know, be repurposed essentially uh, for other county needs or uses in another way. So we want to look at the feasibility of that and the uh, opportunities and constraints as related uh, to how that building could be reused for other uses. Wonderful, thank you. Any questions on the scope of the of the contract? I can tell you about the estimated cost and funding. Yeah, can you run through that for us, please, Katie? Sure. Yep. So the total estimated cost for this contract is one hundred and seventy-eight thousand um, dollars. The state of Colorado through the Department of Local Affairs would cover 35% of that cost, um, so $62,300. So the county would be responsible of that total amount for $115,000. I should clarify, the county is responsible for the full amount and it seeks reimbursement from the state after, after it pays. This is through the um, energy impact uh, <laughs> the acronyms, Energy Impact Assistance Fund Grant, um, Energy in Impact Mineral Assistance Fund, yes. I think um, it's Energy and Mineral Impact Assistance. Thanks, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, Let's yeah, that, the best rate. that was the tier one um, grant that we received from DOLA under that program. Okay, wonderful. Commissioner uh, Mudge and Commissioner Glenn, do you have any questions on this scope of work? I don't. I don't have anything. Katie, I just wanted to ask a question here of Nan and Wells. Um, you know, the big push with the Justice Center is our need to assess the jail and the issues in the jail with the ADA compliance and the safety of the jail. And that has been an ongoing problem for a while. So I want to make sure that we highlight that or focus on that. Can you talk through that a little bit with us about what the focus is with, with that jail and that schematic and uh, space needs? Wells, do you want to speak to that, or do you want me to? Wells, you may be muted. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> muted here, and I'm having internet issues at the moment. So, Nan, if you could start, I'd appreciate it. And I'll sure. Back. 
Yeah, Commissioner Marcella, that's absolutely embedded in this initial phase of the design. So there will be a certain number of, for instance, jail beds that will need to be, or jail cells that will need to be accessible. The entire facility from the main entry to the fire exits will need to be accessible. The, um, wherever the public, uh, and really for that matter, staff spaces need to be accessible. So all of that is embedded in the design process for sure. So that at the end of the day, the both facilities, the courthouse and the jail, will meet the Americans with Disabilities Act requirements. Thank you. Wells and Nan, you know, we are, we are going into somewhat of a scary future and position with our projected revenues from the environmental reaction to the COVID pandemic. Will the schematic for the jail and current courthouse facility also, and, and repurposing of that current courthouse facility also accommodate for that in this work or will we how will we incorporate that planning and future projection and forecasting well so you there you want sure, to yeah I, i'm back and i apologize okay. for that actually i had a, a dog that unplugged my computer <laughs> so that was the <laughs> i have a 12 week old puppy so full disclosure i apologize for that distraction. um uh, Commissioner Marsala, I just want to make sure I understand that question clearly, and, and certainly these are new and unprecedented times that we're all experiencing. And uh, if I understood your question correctly, you're, what, you're asking how our work to update the programming and the schematic design for the project might be influenced by uh, just the current state of circumstances. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, that's a good point. And, and uh, again, I think we're all uh, learning from this day to day, but I would just emphasize that that would absolutely be a priority uh, in terms of our facilitating discussions with all stakeholders to make sure that we're considering um, how to manage this. You know, we we have heard a lot about how uh, different um, uh, sort of detention facilities are dealing with or struggling really with you know, the spread of COVID-19. And, and so we're gonna need to take that into consideration. Uh, absolutely, short answer is yes, that would be at the forefront of the discussions we would bring to the stakeholder group uh, to clarify further how we could incorporate into the design, even the schematic design for this project. I hope that answers your question. Can I, can I pile on a little bit there, Wells, too? Because- Please, please this, do, Dan. thank you. This was also a question actually back in 2015, 2016, because uh, money was tight then, money is tight now, That's, that hasn't changed. And I think what is incumbent upon us as designers is to say, to work with you all and the courts and the sheriff to come up with, okay, what is the absolute bare bones must have? And then how do we design a facility that could grow to add, whether it's jail beds or additional conference spaces or whatever the lesser needs are, but we have to work with you all hand in glove to figure out what's, where do we start? And then how can we design so that if in the future more money becomes available, it's easy to add on. Thank you, Nan, that's a great ad. Yeah, thank you. I think that answers my question, Nan. I think we know right now at this point, if we have to go through, I just you know wanna make sure that we're, understanding the prioritization of our, our top need right now is a jail facility because yep. we're spending so much money with and putting so much risk out there with transporting those inmates. Right. Uh, you know, on top of increasing the likelihood of the spread of COVID, we're also putting people at risk by being on the road, we're spending money being on the road, wear and tear on vehicles, all those kinds of things. So I just wanna make sure that, you know, we're incorporating, incorporating that as, as a top priority as we go into starting some of the more in-depth planning phases of the Justice Center project. Totally on that page, yep. Wonderful. 
Commissioner Glenn and Commissioner Mudge, do you have any further questions at this point? Sorry, that wasn't working. I don't have any other questions. I do appreciate you bringing up that point though. Um, I appreciate acknowledging it and uh, I agree. I think, um, you know, this is, this is a project that we need to try to um, continue to move forward um, to reduce the county's liability through uh, multiple circumstances and, and uh, risks that are put upon us. So thank you. And what is the title of this? Uh, so I can get that. I'm sorry. So I can get that uh, motion correct for this separate contract. Uh, I think we've just been referring to it as the um, contract to perform a needs assessment, preliminary initial schematics, and backfill plan. Okay. Instead of long, but. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, I'll move to approve uh, the engagement in the contract with Anderson Hollis for the needs assessment, the initial schem schematics, and backfill plan for the existing Lake County Courthouse. Second. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor. Um, Commissioner Glenn, do you have any further discussion? No, I have nothing. Commissioner Mudge? No, thank you. Okay, with a no further discussion and a motion on the floor, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Opposed. Okay. With that, we have two ayes and one opposed to move forward with this schematic and planning contract with Anderson Hollis. We will get these signed and recorded and back to you soon. Thank you for joining us today, Nan and Wells. We appreciate it. Thanks so much, all. Look forward to working with you. Thank you. Ditto. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Okay. With that, we will move on to our next agenda item, which is the emergency elevator repair. Commissioner Glenn forwarded us some information on the repair and maintenance for the elevator. Commissioner Glenn, do you want to walk us through that? Yeah, apparently this is, uh, these parts are the original uh, elevator. They're guides for the rollers uh, and they have worn out. Um, we we need to get this fixed due to ADA requirements. Um, and I'm pretty sure Crystal's in the loop on this. She's mentioned in the letter um, and where to send the, send the down payment as it's called. It's half the initial price. So, um, and then that to me is the most important getting this on the schedule so that we can get it fixed. Thank you. Thanks for taking the lead on that, Commissioner Glenn. We do appreciate it. Crystal, do you want to jump in here and talk to us a little bit about the budget, uh, the expected cost of the repair and give us a recommendation of where we can take this unbudgeted expense from? Um, sure. I don't have the invoice up in front of me, but I think it was just shy of 20000 Is that correct, Commissioner Glenn? Um, yes, it was $19,360. Uh, uh, the down payment would amount to $9,680. Okay, thank you. Um, I did reach out, uh, per the commissioners, I did reach out to... CTSI to see if there, you know, if anything would qualify for an insurance claim. I haven't received anything back, but um, my guess would be that no, this is normal wear and tear, especially um, as old as the elevator is. I believe that it was installed in 1955, um, so parts wear out um, and have to be replaced uh, over time. Um, 
I would recommend that we go ahead and and bud <laughs> maintenance budget under the courthouse repairs and maintenance and just keep it there for for tracking um, and at the end of the year, if we need to do a supplemental budget, we can we can make those adjustments then. Wonderful. Um, thank you for that. Sorry, something weird's going on with my screen here. Um, Commissioner Marger, Commissioner Glenn, do you have any additional information or questions? No, I don't. I'm sorry. Some my my screen is flipping out too. <laughs> um, I don't have any questions. I'll make a motion uh, to move ahead with the elevator repair at the courthouse. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second on the floor. Is there any further discussion from Commissioner Glenn or Commissioner Mud? Nope. I have nothing. Okay. Thank you for taking the lead on this, Commissioner Glenn. We appreciate it. Well, I appreciate it a lot. Thank you for bringing this to us. With that, all in favor? Aye. 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 Wonderful. Crystal, we will forward you that invoice to get that repair started and get the ball rolling. Um, and I think with that, we will move into. So, can you want to just one thing on that? Um, I believe it is a, a like a work order contract and requires signatures. So you all will will sign that correct, and then I'll get it signed by uh, Thies and Krupp, and we'll get that recorded um, as well. Sure. Commissioner Glenn, do you know if I need to sign that contract, or is that something you? Would signs or is your name on it? It it actually has my name on it, and I think that's only because uh, I've worked with Chris in the past on getting documentation. So I was just a contact that he happened to have. If we need to have that rewritten with uh, one of the commissioners' names, I'm sure we can we can send that back and have that updated. Yeah, Chris, if you yeah. oh, go ahead, go ahead, Commissioner Glenn. Sorry. It's got your name on here, Crystal, and then next to it, it says signature of branch representative, I guess. That would be decent crop. Okay. Uh, I'll, we, I'll can, we can fix this work order uh, and make it work for, for our needs as well, I think. I was going to say I can. Uh, we can uh, make a formal motion to authorize Crystal to sign to sign. Okay. Since we formally Good. approved, I think. So we don't, we can just keep it sure. moving quickly. Sure, that will work. Okay, I'll, I'll move to authorize Crystal Hewlett to uh, sign the contract with, what, what's the name? I'm sorry. Tyson Krupp. Tyson Krupp. On behalf of the um, I'll take that motion. Wonderful. So we have a motion on the floor in a second. Is there any further discussion from Commissioner Mudge or Commissioner Glenn? No. No. Okay, and none from myself. With that, all those in favor to allow Crystal Hewlett to sign on behalf of the board for the elevator repair with Eisenkrupp? Aye. 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 Great. Thank you so much for working on that. Crystal and Commissioner Glenn, we appreciate it. Thank you for doing that. So with that, we will move into our next topic, which is our, our meeting with the Board of Health. And I will hand it over to Colleen Nielsen, who is our Director of Public Health at this point. Hey, <clears throat> thank you. Wow, I apparently didn't talk for five minutes and uh, I got all uh, choked up. But thank you so much. So I would like to move into our Board of Health and I just wanna recognize um, who is currently here for our Board of Health. So it looks like um, Commissioner uh, Marcella is here, Commissioner Glenn, I believe Cornelia Patty is here, Steve Boyle is here, as well as Kim Jackson. So we do have all five members of our board um, currently here. So thank you for that. I did put in the chat 
the agenda. I apologize. I'm having some issues on my end and getting some information out. And I realize that I am a little delayed, but we do have the kind of we're following our normal format on that. And so once again, I'd just like to welcome everyone. So obviously if you're um, not interested in what's happening in the Board of Health or what we're doing moving forward, then um, obviously you don't need to stay for this portion of the meeting. But so the first thing is our usual report from Paul Clarkson, Director of Building and Land Use. I have nothing to report. Great, thanks Paul. Second, we have um, Jackie Littlepage, our Director of Environmental Health. Um, I would like to request a um, Board of Health public hearing to be scheduled um, sometime in late June um, to hear variance requests for two septic systems. And I'll need at least 20 days, uh, 20 business days notice so that I can get out um, the required written notifications to adjacent properties um, for those folks. So I kindly request that we schedule a um, Board of Health public hearing. Um, yeah. Jackie, when would you like that? Like the first week of June, sooner? Like where are you at so we can kind of talk about dates? So the end of June. So let me pull up my calendar here. Oh, that's right. Sorry. Yeah, you have to push out the notice first and then yes. Sorry about that. Yes, no, that's okay. Um, so for me, it looks like the last week of June, which would be the, um, well, <laughs> either the 29th, 30th, or into July 1, 2, 3. I don't know how busy that week is for Board of Health members, but that one's open for me. Jackie, Jackie so that, go, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Colleen. Oh, I was just going to ask, is that normally a meeting that we schedule in the evening time versus during the day? Um, the two property owners um, are pretty flexible so far, and so I don't anticipate any um, issues. So I would say that that is up to the Board of Health to decide what time they want. And then we just post it back to those property owners that this is the date and time of your public hearing. And they are requested to attend their own public hearing. Um, and if there's any adjacent property owners or anyone who cannot attend, they are allowed to submit um, their public comments in writing um, to be heard by the Board of Health and I can uh, read those out and present them if other folks aren't able to join. Jackie, this is Kayla. Um, I have a quick question for you here. Sure. I, I was wondering um, the process for going through a public hearing, hearing for a variance for those septics. The, I'm assuming that these are things that can't be done administratively, is that correct? Correct. Okay, and I, I think the 29th of June would be okay. I just would like to throw that one out there. Great. Anybody else from the Board of Health feel that June um, 29th will work for them? Uh, 29th works for me. It's way far out, so nobody can catch me. So I can I can make it. Okay. I can be there. What time, Jackie? Um, that's up to you all. Um, we could say one o'clock, or if that's a regular board of health, or I'm sorry, um, county commissioners, maybe two o'clock. I don't I don't know what your schedule looks like. We don't currently have a meeting scheduled for that day because it's the third Monday of the month. So we can we can schedule this for one o'clock on the 29th. Sounds good to me. All right. So if you want to send out a calendar invite, I can um, put that on the calendar for us and we can coordinate getting a Zoom link set up or whatever that looks like for us at that point would be great and because it's a, a public hearing I believe it would need to be recorded and um, 
all that good stuff. So yeah. I appreciate your help with that. Yeah, Paul, could you help us with the coordination of posting that and the meeting venue for that, like we've done with the Planning Commission and other posted meetings that we, public hearings that we have done for the Land Use Department, Building and Land Use Department? Certainly. Awesome. All right, sounds great. Thanks, Paul. Yes, thank you. And Jackie, can you just give us a little background why we need a variance on these properties? Uh, yes, one of them is a new build proposed in uh, Twin Lakes Village, and uh, it's required variance because the new build's well is within 100 foot setback to their septic system, and by state Reg 43, uh, it states that septic systems cannot be built within 100 feet of that well. So it would require Board of Health approval if so chosen to allow that um, homeowner to build within that setback knowing that they um, are taking on that personal liability and risk that their septic system would be close to their well. Um, that one the consideration for the board to think about then is it would also not just be that homer on there it could possibly fall on um adjacent or i'm sorry homeowners that would come after that if the property was ever to sell again um the second property is a an existing property that was built without any building permits, without any septic permits, and they are now going for the variance to accept their illegal vault. Um, and here in Lake County, our regulations state that a vaulted system requires a variance. So those are the two that we have as of today that need this variance process. Great, thank you, Jackie. Is there anything else um, as far as reports that you'd like to share? Do we need to discuss or, or let them know um, the process of um, businesses opening or anything? Yeah, if you want to share that. Okay, sure. So this morning we were just Because it's falling into your wheelhouse right now, then yes, if you want to just share. I know a lot of folks have been on multiple calls, on commissioner's calls and kind of tracking, but I think it's important just to bring it back up so they understand the division of how we're doing this. Sure. Uh, so this morning we were discussing again, uh, as we open up businesses or opportunities for uh, different venues to open with, under the safer at home or new public health orders, what that would look like. We specifically discussed um, hotels and short-term rentals and possible guidance documents that we can be um, using to offer as the protocols under which they would open or resume services. Um, we've discussed the potential dates for allowing those businesses to open up. Um, as of today, you know, it sounded like June 1st is still the most feasible date to allow hotels and as uh, short-term rentals to open to um, general public outside of Lake County, uh, just because we still have a lot of um, work that needs to be done behind the scenes, creating those protocols, creating that process, and making sure that we have that um, set and ready to receive those protocol applications and then issue those uh, license or, or acceptance letters to allow them to operate. Uh, so that was for that one. Um, retail food establishments is another set of businesses that we are working on behind the scenes. Um, Governor Polis's current timeline is he's set to give some kind of an update on May 25th. That is a Monday and that is Memorial Day. Um, that date is currently his date of when he will give a decision as to if retail food will open up to dining or not statewide. Um, so at this point in time, we are working on some guidance documents to have at the ready in case he says, 
go, restaurants can open up. Um, we want to have that guidance ready because um, historically, Governor Polis has given some dates and said go ahead and then the guidance documents don't come until several days later. So we're trying to get some guidance documents um, ready and if for any reason he pushes out his okay with some guidance documents, that would be spectacular and we would be using whatever comes out. Um, I think that's it on my end. Great, thank you Jackie so much. So moving on to my report, if you will, COVID-19, as all of you are highly aware, we're currently in a pandemic and the fact is that most of you have been on multiple calls over the last couple of weeks. I asked specifically, specifically for the Board of Health to be present for the update from Dr. Lisa last Tuesday. We are finding that Dr. Lisa will update um, the BOCC on Tuesdays at 1 p.m. with all of the latest data from you know, the week before so that we're tracking appropriately. Obviously, if you're able to make that as the Board of Health, so you just can kind of stay in the loop um, of what that looks like, but obviously no. Um, and we are working on um, a document that we can share out. So I'm actually gonna make a note right now that, um, that I will send that out to the Board of Health specifically so you can just get that um, update on the data and where we're at. So as of right now, we have pushed out three public health orders during this pandemic. The latest one is the Safer at Home, which is the you know, phase we're in now, kind of following in line with the governors. What Jackie was talking about is some of the future businesses that we are looking to open, but because of the Safer Home, we have been able to process and open over 40 plus businesses here in Lake County. Um, we are using our environmental health team for that. There is a form that folks fill out, and then any questions or anything they need, um, we ask them to email environmental health at co.lake.co.us. That's been working really well. We are increasing our staffing for the next phase, if you will, knowing that there's opportunity for um, hotels, motels, short-term rentals, and possibly restaurants, bars. And so um, to Jackie's point, we are setting up guidelines, but we think will work here in Lake County. And Jackie also recognized that currently there aren't any guidelines that have been like official guidelines from the governor, but we do not want to wait that long. And we want to make sure that our business community has as much information as possible so that when that time comes, we're all ready to go in the sense of, you know, have the guidance and actually, you know, feasibly apply that guidance in their business, train up their employees, get their spaces ready. And so that's why we are sticking to that June 1st um, deadline. When you think about it, that is um, just two weeks away. So very quick when you think about the amount of um, work that's going to be happening on the business end, as well as um, on the public health end. Does anyone have any specific questions for me? before we go into the framework that you guys have seen multiple times and I will share it on the screen because that is something I want to officially adopt through our Board of Health, recognizing that this is truly how we've been basing our decisions from the beginning. And I recognize that I'm a week or two or um, five late, I don't know, in the sense of so much things that you guys have known has been happening so fast and changing and evolving, um, but we still feel really strongly about this framework and I wanna make sure that we're all comfortable um, with that um, moving forward as our official, you know, document that's adopted from Board of Health. I got a weird question for you guys. Yeah. I, I saw something on Facebook, but I, I forget if it was our state. But for Board of Health, if you have a business, restaurant, or a hotel that uh, goes into compliance with the regulations that you put out for COVID, do you po post any signage that they're COVID compliant? Is Would that be something the state's doing? No, and so part of our business protocol is that they are required to have signage at the door saying what social distancing protocols are. And they're also required to post our um, acceptance letter that they are following social distancing. So that is if somebody looks at their front business, they should have both of those things posted. Perfect, okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. No, great question, Steve. Hey, Colleen, it's Lori. I have a question too I've been meaning to ask you. How okay. is the public going to be informed which businesses are or are not uh, meeting that criteria and open for business? Um, that's a great question. We haven't come across anybody that's opened prematurely at this point in time. I don't know uh, if, is the request that we put a list together of everyone who's been approved and share that? Is, is that sound like appropriate or something you're looking for? 
I'm just inquiring, uh, as businesses are being approved on this application process, how is, uh, clearly the business will be informed that they have met the criteria and can open, but what about the community as a whole regarding those businesses? Yes, yeah, so it sounds like you'd like us to publish all of the businesses that currently um, have gotten their acceptance letters. Like we can make that part of our communication. So weekly, we do push out a communication to the community every Thursday. Tonight's will go out pretty late. We've got um, a couple things uh, kind of on the back burner. And so I think, you know, is that something we're looking to share or is that something um, that businesses are responsible for? I feel like that's like an additional step that we may not be able to accurately update that list. So I prefer businesses to um, market themselves, if you will, saying, hey, we're open, we're available. And, um, and people should recognize whether or not that there's uh, an acceptance letter in you know, their window. Right, that acceptance letter that we issue is supposed to be posted in their window or on their door so that um, clients or the public, as if they're entering into a facility, they can see it posted that, yes, that um, business is allowed to operate. Perfect. That's exactly what I was looking for. Thank you, ladies. Yes, because I'm like, the more I'm like thinking about it, right? I was like, oh my gosh, what happens if we miss a business that we said that they were okay to open and they're not on the list and then people are reporting them and everything else. I think it's uh, more, more appropriately to educate the community that, hey, look for that letter versus um, posting a list. So I appreciate that question, Lori, and thank you for resolving that, guys. So. Colleen, this is Kayla. Yeah. Um, if you have a business that doesn't comply, with the proper protocol to open, what is the enforcement like for that business establishment? Yes, yeah, so the ability for any business to open, whether that's in the city and or the county, depending on you know which jurisdiction, obviously retail food is something that we license. We know that the city licenses you know, retail businesses and things like that. So if somebody is out of compliance, um, we would make that decision and obviously we would work through the Board of Health to say these folks are out of compliance. Our recommendation is to close them. We get that vote from the Board of Health that says, yes, we agree. And so it's basically a cease and desist um, you know, letter. And Jackie, I don't know if you can share more having had experience with having to close a business that's been out of compliance or something else, not COVID at this point. Correct. And right now, uh, Governor Polis's office and CDPHE also have a, a process that can help back um, local county governments. So, uh, if there's a facility that is not adhering to um, county orders to close, then CDPHE also steps in um, and looks for a cease and desist order. Um, hopefully it's something that we can resolve locally and, and we will definitely work on a case-by-case -case scenario with each uh, business owner and try to make sure that we get that rectified. But. Yeah. Yeah, obviously the first piece is education and if they're able to correct, you know, whatever that um, violation is pretty quickly, then, you know, there wouldn't be a reason to close them down. And we've, we've found that with some other, you know, our retail food businesses being like, oh, we recognize that. You can either change it right then on site. If it's something totally, um, um, is flagrant the right word? Is that, am I using that word right? In, in the sense of like fully violating the order intentionally and not, you know, um, that, that kind of changes how we might go about that, so. Yes. Hey, Colleen, Thank you, Colleen. Uh, Colleen, question for you. Does that mean you guys are going about town checking on businesses? Uh, do you have to do that or, or anticipating doing that? Um, at this point in time, you know, we aren't anticipating doing that. Obviously, people do have the ability to report things to our environmental health email. And then if it's something that we feel that we need to physically go out, we will. At this point in time, as you can imagine, Steve, we're pretty stretched thin and we're kind of relying on you know, our community and our businesses to be doing, you know, exactly what they say they're doing. And obviously, we, if we get a complaint and we feel that it's something we need to go out, we will absolutely do that. Yeah, Terrific. Yeah. Hopefully you don't, but uh, yes, thank you for that answer. Yeah. Yeah, and I'll just put it out there that um, as of today, we have one complaint um, that a building on Main Street is being used as an unlicensed gym. Um, we're still investigating that. And uh, if that was to come forward further um, as an actual um, valid issue that we need to uh, try to shut down, we would definitely be notifying the city and the county um, and trying to figure out if that is acting as a business or if it's just uh, 
some folks being rebels, but we'll cross that bridge when we get there. And so um, with that, I am going to share my screen and um, bring up that framework so we can have an official decision on that. And I don't, I, I cannot imagine this is the first time having seen you guys on multiple calls and um, having uh, us um, do this piece. So let me, sorry, I gotta minimize this. So basically, sorry. Can you guys see this okay? Yeah. Yes, I can. Okay, yes, great. I apologize. Um, we have some construction going on outside and um, our building is currently vibrating. <laughs> so I'm like trying to hear and not, not shake and, and my um, screen's a little funky. But basically, like I said, you guys have seen this and basically we've now, you know, put it on our official letterhead. We put, you know, if obviously I can change this, but I just wanted for um, sake that Lake County Public Health Agency has, has adopted it. The evidence-based data-driven guidelines provided by the Colorado Association of Lo Local Public Health Officers, so that's CALFO, where we mentioned them multiple times. These guidelines allow for best practice public health approach to relaxing state home orders and other limitations on commerce and social activity. And so when we, sorry, this is kind of funky. So when we talk about you know, all the things that we're trying to do, we've been talking about like what that new normal looks like and in order for us to kind of continue to move forward and move into that beginning stage, which is like the ski map, which I've talked about in the sense of, you know, we're on the beginner slope right now. We, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we weren't on, we weren't even on the chairlift in the sense of we couldn't meet all five of these criteria. But the fact that we have been able to increase our testing, um, have a sustained level of cases, um, as well as, you know, the hospital feeling confident that they can, you know, handle anything currently. Um, and then, the other ones being, you know, active monitoring with COVID-19, which we do have the ability to do that. Uh, I would like to share that we have four nurses, um, volunteer nurses that are willing to do contact tracing. We're currently working on a protocol for them. And I'll reach out to Lori here once we kind of have a protocol in place and how we want to bring volunteers on board uh, as far as that goes. And so I think um, that's just important to note that we, we recognize that if we have to expand out, we won't need to rely on county resources. We'll have the ability to use these volunteer nurses um, to do all the pieces that we need with contact tracing and feel confident with those three additional staff that even if we were to get a major increase, we'll be able to handle that. And so, um, and the last part is the clear protocol in place that requires social distancing and assist with case definition. And so we do have social distancing. distancing. I, I don't know if I, you know, I'm gonna pick up that now. I was gonna pick on Paul and be like, Paul, tell me everything you know about social distancing, right? It's six feet apart. It's wearing your face covering in public. It's washing your hands. It's not touching your face. It's, you know, um, being responsible and, uh, and you know, all those other things. So I think, you know, I think a lot of folks are really confident with what all of that looks like. And then this is kind of where we're at right now. So this is the stabilization phase. This is our new normal. And we're coming into, you know, the green circle. We have been doing some openings, like we said, 40 plus businesses have already been able to open. We're working on guidelines for um, almost majority of the rest of our businesses. So I'm thinking by June 1st, we actually might, you know, obviously with some decreases in where folks are able to do because of the social distancing protocol, you're only allowed to have a certain amount of folks, you know, in your facility that will go for, you know, restaurants. And um, we'll talk with hotels and motels about what their capacity might look like recognizing that that's the new normal it's not like a full you know, doors wide open business back to normal it's still you know slow increments working towards um, what we can or can't do especially in the face of social distancing and so if we scroll down you know it talks about all the things you guys already know but this is a phase reopening currently with our safer at home we are at a group size gathering of, of 10 and um, you know if we're able to do everything well and we can move into the next phase, which is like the intermediate phase, that group size might increase. We are currently following the governor's orders that to groups of 10, limiting things to group of 10, we are comfortable with that. It doesn't necessarily apply to businesses in the sense of depending on their square footage, public in general, and even um, as many of you are aware with our special events that you know, the, the decision had come down that they are um, canceled for the summer because even if we did everything well, and we got to group sizes of 250, 
still would be, be we still wouldn't have the ability to hold um, a large event here. And obviously, we want to be mindful. We want to go slow. We don't want to go backwards, and we just want to take this one step at a time. So this is where we're at. I feel like you guys have seen this framework. So basically what happens, you know, Dr. Lisa and I are in contact as well as the hospital. We talk um, multiple times a week just to check in, see where we're at. And then we kind of look at where we're at as, um, you know, in these phases and um, kind of make the decisions. And at this point in time, like I said, you know, our intent is truly to go slow so that we don't have to go backwards. I think it's easier for us to slowly open things versus having to go backwards and close things. So um, this is the framework. I, like I said, I know that many of you have seen multiple times, but I would like to officially adopt it um, as uh, a Board of Health, recognizing that this is the framework that public health is using. Does anyone have any questions about the framework? I got one, Colleen. Yeah. The, uh, the thing you talked about with uh, volunteers, uh, do, do they have to be required to take that six-hour class that CDPHE is, has online? I think oh. it was a six-hour class on tracing. So we do have a whole entire protocol that they will have to take. I don't know if the CDC1 is the one um, we'll actually do because CDPHE has come out with their own guidance. And so I would think that we would do the state because as you can imagine, um, nationally, we're not all doing things the same exact way. It will be a robust training program for that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any questions around the framework? Like I said, I recognize that you guys have seen these this multiple times. It's just is now in our letterhead. Let's go. No, I think it looks great, Colleen. Thank you. Okay. Does um, anyone, oh, go ahead. No, I thought I had a question, but I don't think I do. Okay. Actually, anyone, I do, even though I've seen this a million times. You're right. Yeah. Um, the the green dot, the blue square, and the black diamond. Yes. The size uh, for the green dot is 10. The group size for uh, the blue square is 25 to 50, uh -huh. and the um, black diamond is 250. Yep. What about the gaps? So what about like between uh, 10 and 25? And what about 51 to 249? What? <laughs> no, I absolutely understand what you're saying, and I think um, you know, this is just like a framework in the sense of, you know, there will be ability to adapt things as they come and to kind of expand between those different parameters between, like you said, between, you know, 10 and, and 24 and 50 to 249. Like, I think it's just kind of giving you that overview of what to expect. And, and recognize that, you know, as public health and working with the governor, you know, and the state that, you know, we'll see what those recommendations are as they come down. So it might be even smaller, right? We might not make a jump from 10 to 25. We might make a jump to you know, 15 and then you know, 25 the following week or whatever that looks like. We just don't know. It's just, um, it's just a guidance framework at this point in time. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. I don't yeah, think it was ever course. mentioned. All right, if there are no other questions, I, um, is there anyone on the Board of Health who would like to make a motion? I motion to adopt. Okay, Steve. Anyone want a second? I'll second. This is Kayla. Okay, I'll roll call. So Kayla Marcella? Aye. Steve Boyle? Aye. Amelia Patty? We'll come back to Cornelia, Mark Glenn. Aye. Thank you, Mark. Kim Jackson? I don't see Kim on the participant list uh, she, was, she was up on city clerk. She was here with city clerk. Did she get bumped off? Cornelia? I she I might be Hi. Okay. Cornelia? Aye. Thank you. you. So it sounds um, unanimously that this is the framework. Obviously, that's what we've been working with. I, I absolutely appreciate your support as we um, 
have officially adopted to the Board of Health. I think that just helps us continue to use this and everyone's comfortable with that. So I do thank you for that. Um, the next piece of business, believe it or not, as much as COVID-19 is uh, with us, um, is our public health improvement plan. So if you guys recall, that is something we're required to do every five years. We did make a decision in 2017 to follow the hospital because they have to do a community health assessment every three years. And so believe it or not, our health assessment is coming up this year that we are looking at ways that we can be creative because so much of this is gonna happen, have to happen virtually initially until we kind of get through the summer and see what that happens. I just want you to, to make you aware that we are looking um, at what that public health improvement process will look like. We'll do it in conjunction with the hospital and build a generation will help us with that, just like we had done it in 2016 to have it done by 2017. And so, or actually, excuse me, 2017, that's right, 18, 19, 20, I got it, I can do some math. And um, so basically that is just giving you an update that even though so much of our focus is on COVID-19, there's so many things that still have to keep rolling in order for us to do it. And so the other piece of that is you know, this might be beneficial in the sense of a lot of focus is on health right now and people might be more um, inclined to kind of participate in some of the surveys we might push out and like to kind of weigh in on what they think priorities are here in our community. I would like to note that there is a lot of um, cuts happening at the state level. Currently, I believe we're at 3.4 billion um, that needs to be cut out of the state budget, recognizing all of the impacts that COVID-19 has been um, what's the right word, uh, affecting, I think, you know, the state budget and what they're looking at for 2021. We are looking at our public health budget to see what that looks like, just so as you guys um, may remember, almost um, a third of our budget does come from grants. And so we're closely monitoring what is happening at the state level, specifically the Joint Budget Committee, which is currently meeting. So if anyone has time or wants to look at some things, we, uh, you know, and see something that you might be interested in and or that I may not be aware of, please know that I'm available. I'm always open for any feedback that you guys have, especially around this response. Um, I do apologize. I feel like you guys have been, um, guys being the Board of Health have been, you know, kind of on, you know, the sides and cheering and I haven't brought you in fully, um, if you will. So I appreciate coming together today and kind of getting back on the same page and um, going from there. The last piece is, you know, does the board have anything specifically that they need from me at this point in time or anything that they would like to see going forward. Um, once again, on Tuesdays at 1 p.m., we are reporting to the BOCC out of our weekly update. I don't know, you know, obviously, I don't necessarily need all of you guys to be on that, but it's just a great way. And I will ensure that I get the data that Lisa is pushing out weekly so that you are informed in case something does come up and we need to bring you back faster or um, together because obviously our, our obligation um, is quarterly. When I'm ready to change the public health order, I will ensure that you guys get to see it um, prior to going out to public so that you recognize kind of where we're at and what we're doing and if you have any questions and or um, feedback, because that would be important if you are seeing something that I'm not recognizing. So I will make sure that happens for our next public health order, which our plan one ends on May 31st. So I'm already starting to kind of look at some of the pieces I need to change. It won't be drastic, but um, it will allow for a little bit more opening of some of our local businesses. Thanks, Colleen. I have just one quick question um, yeah. with with the guidance. So I know that the guidance goes up to 250, um, and then at the 250 mark, what happens after that? Yeah, I think it's a great question. I think when you look at that guidance and you follow it all the way across, right now that that projects us out to maybe four to eight months. Or excuse me, um, is it, no, is it 16? I have to look at it really quick. But I think it's 16, right? It's four to eight weeks, then four to eight weeks. So eight plus eight, that's like 16 weeks. Um, and so that puts us kind of through the summer and into the fall. I think it will be, I personally, on a personal note, I think just from what I'm seeing, the expectation is that we're gonna have a spike in the fall, no matter what. And so I can't imagine us um, after 250, like I think that that will be extended. I think, you know, we might be in this beginner phase for you know two plus months. Um, prior to even getting into the next one, depending on, you know, Governor Polis and all the data that's coming in. And I think, you know, obviously there's going to be gradual increments of increasing folks, um, but recognizing that until there's some effective treatment and or a vaccine that, you know, group sizes are just going to continue to be limited. It doesn't make sense to bring people into a large space, um, especially if, you know, the infection rates continue to go up. 
And so I'm guessing, yeah, I'm guessing as we get into that expert phase, we'll get more guidance to say, hey, what does the new normal look like for the next like three months? And obviously, you know, relying on CALFO, we all have input, we being um, public health directors have input into that. And I think that question will come up pretty quickly as we get closer to the end of the summer. Cool, thank you for clarifying that. I appreciate it. Uh, actually, I do have one other question. <laughs> yes. Um, it, and it's just a curiosity because I just want to understand. Um, does our hospital see or would our hospital see a reimbursement from putting COVID onto a death certificate? No, I think there's there's been a misnomer out there about, you know, um, providers receiving like additional funding, you know, for a certain diagnosis. I don't necessarily think, I, I understand that there's, um, you know, just like our businesses, just like our, our um, county and, uh, you know, city, there's, there's funding out there available in the sense of if you, you know, have been affected by COVID. So obviously if they had, you know, an increase of COVID patients and, you know, which changes, you know, the amount of PPE that they're going through, you know, versus kind of traditional um, um, pieces. So I don't necessarily think that that is the intent of, you know, I mean, I've obviously heard of like, oh, they're only doing, you know, they being other folks out in the world, they're only doing this to get more money into their hospital. And I, I think um, that's unfortunate that if there are folks doing that, I think it's just a matter of, you know, how they're tracking so that they can see that if they have been affected by those numbers if folks, you know, are dying in their hospital or within that health system, whatever that health system is. I recognize that, you know, they've put a lot more and energy and resources towards one particular, you know, for, for a pandemic, essentially for, you know, what's happening right now. So um, there isn't, like, it's not like the hospital gets any more money. It's more of the recognition that the healthcare facility and or system, because right now we don't have that here, um, that they can link it to show that, yes, they've been treating COVID, but not as a, but not as a, hey, let's just call everyone COVID so we get more money, if that makes sense. Yeah, I just have seen a lot of, um, you know, information out there of, hey, so-and-so died from a car accident and we're going to write it down as, as a COVID death because they had COVID an antibodies or whatever and, and so that the numbers are skewed because of, of that kind of reporting. Yeah, I think that's an unfortunate practice that's not happening here. And always like, I don't, you know, not in those systems. I don't know who's making those decisions, but it's not something that's, you know, happening here. Cool. I don't have anything else. The, I see Patrick has his hand up for a question, oh, maybe. Great. Yes. Let me know. I don't, I can never see the hand. I don't know what that is. Yeah. Go ahead, Patrick. We can't hear you, Patrick. Sorry, Patrick. I don't think we can hear. Okay. I don't see anything else in the chat from him either, so sorry about that. Yeah, no worries. So um, at this point in time, is, um, he, his microphone wasn't working. I don't He's have ready him. to speak now. Thanks, are, Miguel. Are the individual offices in the courthouse going to have to uh, adhere to what the businesses are going through? Um, great question. And we'll actually talk about it at our next elected and directors meeting, which starts in approximately eight minutes. We're just finishing up before I help call. Hey, thanks. No, I appreciate it, Patrick. I think it's a great question, but we'll, we'll touch on that in the next meeting. Okay. Yeah. All right. Great. Okay, if there's nothing else from the Board of Health, um, on my agenda says next Board of Health meeting, um, we need to set it. Obviously, we set one for June 29th um, to follow up on the variance process. Obviously, most of the things that we can kind of do moving forward with me just showing you of where we're at and making sure that I'm receiving your feedback appropriately, like with the public health order. Um, you know, we don't need to kind of meet in um, a group unless there's something big. 
and obviously if there are any things that come up, you know, within, you know, the next month and a half, we'll, we'll, we'll need to convene, but I feel confident at this point that we're at June 29th for our next meeting. And with that, I would say we are done. Cool. Thank you so much, Colleen. And thank you everybody for convening today. Yes. Thank um, you. You guys thanks. are doing amazing. Thanks. We'll see you guys at 2.30. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Bye. I'm going to be careful.